listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast, recorded at the BVA headquarters with your hosts, Bill Whitaker and Tommy Alquist. Bill is the former CEO of the J.R. Simplot Company and is now a full-time adventure seeker and philanthropist. Tommy is the CEO of BVA Development, co-founder of Crush the Curve Idaho, and most importantly, a full-time grandfather. Each episode focuses on sharing the stories of individuals who are changing the world. Welcome back to another episode of Inspire Excellence uh, with my co-host, Bill Whitaker. We are super excited today, Bill. We've been waiting for this guy to come on and can't wait to, to talk to him. Uh, our good friend, uh, Mark Johnson from KTVB here in uh, Boise. Mark, let me just, as part of your intro, I think it's, I, I know I've known you for a while, Bill's known you for a while, but but most of Idaho has known you for a while. I told my wife, she said, I, she said, who is, who is on your podcast today? And, and I told her, Mark Josh, said, oh, great. That's our guy, right? I mean, I mean, you're just in everyone's living rooms, right? I mean, we feel like we, we just know you. And, and that's got to be pretty unique, right, that everyone loves you and knows you. Uh, welcome aboard. I, I just can't wait to chat with you today. We, we appreciate what you do, and it's going to be what, fun. What are you talking about, Tommy? He's in our bedroom every night. <laughs> <laughs> every single that's night right. he's in our bedroom. <laughs> And then, you, you know, know it's, it, it's funny. I was at the mall. <laughs> I was at the mall a, a few years ago, probably 10 years ago. And this lady came running up to me and she was next to her huge truck driver husband. And she looked at me and looked at him and said, honey, when you're out of town, this man is in our bedroom every single night. And he looked at me and he said, who are you? <laughs> well, that's what I'm talking I said, about. I, I'm on that's TV. So I'm on TV. I promise. It's the bedroom television. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it is it is pretty funny because uh, all of a sudden you're going is, at ten o'clock. Is it on Channel Seven? Is it on you know so on and so forth? And and we we get such a kick out of yeah. uh, you know when watching you, especially deciding how much of a journalist you want to be and how much of a kind of an opinion journalist and how much of a anchor you want to be and watch you kind of go, mm, I'd really like to be a journalist right now. And but you're pretty disciplined with <laughs> yeah. it. Not, not totally. I can tell in your well, eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm tickled to be on this podcast with two of the guys that I respect as much as any of our community and business leaders in our state. One guy who has traveled to every major city in the world and another guy who has traveled to every city in Idaho. So I just would like to know, Bill, what did you think of Milan? And Tommy, what did you think of Milan? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, we're, we're asking yeah. the questions for today. I've never been to Milan, and I love Milan. So, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna get right. Hey, I, I'm gonna get right into this because I know this is gonna go fast, Mark. I, I've got a couple questions to ask you, and I and I want to get a little personal with you today because as much as we love you for your on TV personality. Um, you are as much a pillar of this community. I, I, I got to tell you one quick story. If those of you out there have seen Mark host all of the events for all the nonprofits, it's, it's, it's a big part of what you do. In fact, it's probably like your second job. You have your job at KTVB. You have your job as, as, as a husband to, and, and, and father to your beautiful family. But then you spend so much time in the community doing nonprofit work. You hosted one uh, for Boys and Girls Club. It was an early morning event. Um, about a year and a half or two years ago, and I, I, I sat there in the audience just bawling, like tearful, because of the way you touched me that morning on the story you told. Mark, you're a you're a huge community guy. Tell us a little bit about your love for this community. There's a lot of young entrepreneurs. There's a lot of young CEOs on that listen to this podcast. Give us some advice on how to get involved in a community and and what this community means to you. Well, you guys both know me, and we've done a number of nonprofits together. Bill, you, your heart is uh, with the Ronald McDonald House and and so many other nonprofits. And 
you've seen that every single nonprofit event that I end with, and I really mean this sincerely, I always say, we don't live in the best city in the state. We don't live in the best city in the West. We live in the best city in the world. And the reason I say that, and I truly, truly believe that, I have been around the world and I have lived and worked in other cities in America. And I don't think there's another city like ours that shows its heart. Uh, and I say city, I should say our region that shows its heart and its devotion to less fortunate, to organizations that need help, that do great things for our kids, that help our needy, that help our sick, that help our elderly, that help really every single corner of our community, these nonprofits touch. And the fact that people like you support those nonprofits and those events, that just, I tell you, I have to button my shirt every once in a while because my heart pops out. And I, I just, uh, I sincerely believe we live in the greatest place in the world. And, um, so it's I don't need a teleprompter, I guess, is what I'm saying when I when I do these nonprofit events, because uh, it's all right here. You know, I've uh, I've experienced you doing those nonprofit events and and it is absolutely a thrill. We don't need uh, outside speakers. We don't we don't need anything. We need Mark Johnson. And so I got to tell you a little <laughs> bit of a story about yourself. Uh, when I first came to Boise, which is now 22 years ago, um, the uh, I remember being at the Danny Thompson and you were a ring man at the auction. And I thought, <laughs> and I'm watching this guy yeah. and I said, this is the guy on, you know, Channel 7 and so on and so forth. But the point is, is it um, your energy and passion and uh, connection to people is second to none. And, uh, but someplace along here, Tommy, we need to talk about um, what it means to have two sets of twins. Because I've heard you speak, <laughs> I've heard you speak to it a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two sets of twins. So, and not only two sets of twins, but both sets born at St. Luke's Hospital. And um, I asked about, I did some research about uh, 10 years ago. So the, the first set were born in 84. The second set born in 2002, 18 years apart. And so I went back to St. Luke's and I said, we need to go through the records and find out how many fathers there have been of two sets of twins. They got back to me. I think it was Jeff Selick got back to me and said, we've scoured the records and we found out that there have been a number of fathers of two sets of twins, boy, girl and boy, boy, which are the two most prominent. But the th least of the three possibilities for twins is girl, girl. And we believe that you're the only father in the history of St. Luke's, 120 <laughs> years of two sets of twin daughters. Wow. And I said, where's my ribbon? Yeah. Where's a medal? Where's my trophy? Oh, nothing. That's funny. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, talk to us a little bit about, I, I know how much you love your, your girls. Talk to us a little bit about raising them and being a father and uh, any advice you have for, for fathers out there that uh, that may be meaningful today? You know, it, it's such a fine line that I walk. You guys know my personality and you know I, I like to have fun. Sometimes I cross the line on the air and sometimes I cross the line at home too, you know. So uh, now that my daughters are 18, they let me know, dad, you need to stop with the dad jokes now because you're embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing <laughs> us. So I've had to walk that fine line between, you know, being the father and being the funny man. And so I, I'm, I'm, I've learned how to kind of do that, but uh, I, all four of those daughters, uh, I'm finally a grandfather. My daughter in Seattle who works at Seattle children's as a teacher uh, he gave us our first grandson last summer. Uh, 
Arthur Ash is his name, and we call him Baby Artie. And so I, I'm just tickled about that. And uh, my other twin, as you know, Tommy works at Salter, the clinic in uh, in the Harris Ranch area, and she just loves her job at Salter Medical. And then the other twins, um, they they couldn't be more delightful. Gracie is going to go to Boise State next year. Alexa is going to go to Wazoo. And they are two different personalities, but they are, have so much depth and uh and i just i i love them to death and I, I i can't get enough of them and i'm so blessed to have four girls oh, you bet no that's for sure so uh university of missouri uh i'm from missouri and uh <laughs> And you went to the University of Missouri and then found your way around to a different couple of different markets and came back to KTVB as a sports announcer. Uh, talk a little bit about that evolution. Well, um, Bill, as you know, my first job out of Mizzou was in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, back in 1981, home of Rush Limbaugh. Um, and uh, <laughs> I enjoyed living in the river town. But all of a sudden, Boise, Idaho came calling and said, um, you want to come here and and be a sports director. And I said, I love to ski. I love the Northwest. Uh, let's do it. I was recently married. We came here in 83. The girls were born in 84. And I spent five glorious years here uh, doing play by play for the University of Idaho football with Jerry Kramer as my analyst and color man. Are you kidding me? Really? As a Green Bay Packer really? fan, to have Jerry Kramer in the booth? Oh, my gosh. Oh my. And Jerry didn't charge us a dime. And all he wanted was a charter flight. He wanted us to rent an airplane to get us to Moscow or Flagstaff or Ogden, Utah. And he wanted to bring uh, one of his – kids or two of his kids along and we would fly in the night before the game and fly back the night of the game and the whole time I would sit next to him and say what was Vince Lombardi like what was Bart Starr like and the whole time I have goosebumps just telling you the story and as a Packers fan to have that guy in my co-pilot seat was just incredible so I spent uh Five great years here, but then, of course, as any young broadcaster does, you got to chase the big market. You got to make more money. Uh, I got offers to go to CNN. I got an offer to go to San Antonio, and I got this offer to go to Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1988. And I thought, covering the Packers and the Brewers and the Bucks and PGA, I went. And I spent eight years there. Um, I was divorced uh, from my wife. Uh, she stayed in Boise with the twins and we flew the twins out every summer, every Christmas and uh, or I did. And then I met my my wife there in Milwaukee and I got a uh, promotion and a transfer to Pittsburgh. And I went to Pittsburgh and covered the Steelers in Super Bowl 30 and covered Arnold Palmer and got to know him pretty well. And it was just delightful. And in 1996, I was covering Super Bowl 30 down in Tempe, Arizona. And I got a call from Bob Kruger, my old boss at KTVB. And he said, it's time for you to come home. <laughs> and I said, Bob, I'm in Tempe covering Super Bowl 30. What are you talking about? He said, I'm going to give you a 50% pay cut and you're going to come home. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my wife said, I, I said, you know, we can't afford to go back to Boise. And she said, the girls are in fifth grade. We can't afford not to watch them grow up. So we came back and watched my twins grow up. And when they were seniors in high school, I really thought we would end up going back to the big market. And then all of a sudden, boom, 
Another set of twins show up. <laughs> We're home, baby. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. And and Doug Armstrong, our new boss, came to me and said, hey, we're losing our main anchor, and I want to turn you into our main anchor. It's time for you to get out of the sports chair and into the main anchor desk. And, and that was uh, almost 20 years ago. And I said, I- I'm just afraid that you're not going to be able to turn me into a credible newsman. And he said, let me tell you what, and you guys know this about Channel 7. He said, with our promotions machine, I could turn Homer Simpson into an anchor man. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, you've been more than okay. So, Mark, if you know, every once in a while, when some major crisis comes forward, uh, and, and I watch you on air, and um, and there are just times when I can just feel the compassion and the emotion that you have to manage on air with some really, really tough news to report on. What's, what's that like? Because I don't know if I could do it, honestly. I, in fact, I probably couldn't do it. You know what, Bill? That's a great question. And I've, I've wrestled with that a lot because as a sports guy – You don't walk out into the studio until 20 minutes after the hour. You have no idea what has transpired from 10 until 1020. When I was a sports guy and I'd come home, I was happy, happy. And as a newsman, and you have a front row seat for some of the deepest, ugliest, most uh, despair stories that you could possibly imagine – And you sit there on the set and you deliver that news or you do a live interview with a mother who just lost her children in a car accident. And you come home and you take your tie off and you sit down on the couch and you say, I hope that's the last thing I ever have to do like that. And then it happens again and again. It's it's, it it can be hard. And And the other thing about it is. We're not national news, right? I, I'm not doing the story about somebody that lives, uh, you know, thousands or hundreds of miles away. These are stories about people that live in my community. And so these are people that are my neighbors, maybe friends. And that makes it even harder when that stabbing happened uh, on State Street almost three years ago and the little girl, three-year-old girl at her birthday party got stabbed and died. Um, I, I, I cried on the air. I teared up on the air and I tried not to, cause you want to be the anchor man and you want to, but that apartment complex, I live at plantation on state street. As you guys know, it's, two miles away from that apartment complex. I drive by it four times a day. And I felt like this was a neighbor of mine. And to see that happen in my neighborhood and me having to report that on the air. Mm. Man, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. Hey, Mark, uh, I, I, I made a list of things I wanted to ask you, and I know we're not going to get to almost any of it. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a little rapid fire around here. Okay. Most, most memorable interview. Uh, and, and maybe you've had a lot of them, but is there, is, there, is there one that stands out or a couple that stand out? Yeah, Muhammad Ali. Mm. Ooh. Wow. Without a wow. doubt. Wow. Wow. Uh, uh, he said, I said, he was an hour late. I was supposed to interview him live on the air at five o'clock in Boise. And I went to his hotel. He didn't show up. I knocked on his door. His handlers came out and said, champ will be out in 15 minutes. No, well, five thirty rolls around. He's not out. Six o'clock rolls around. He's not out. Knock on the door. He'll be out in 10 minutes. Nothing. At 625, we have five minutes left in our newscast. Here comes the champ. And he sits down and he's got a 
He's got a shaving cut on his chin. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. I said, champ, you got more blood on your face right here, right now in Boise, Idaho, than you had in 20 professional years of boxing. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, who are you, the local <laughs> Howard Cosell? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That is just fantastic. That's perfect. Yeah, That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. And, he, most, and he did like most, that. There, here we go. Most memorable golf shot. Oh. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, <laughs> Pro-Am – with Steve Stricker on the par five eighteenth at Brown Deer Golf Club in the Pro Am, I hit my second shot onto the green with a three wood to ten feet and made the putt for an eagle. And the next day, the reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel said, how hard can the 18th hole be if Mark Johnson makes an eagle? <laughs> <laughs> this is some good stuff, Yeah, Bill. I agree. This is some good stuff. <laughs> Bill, do you want to take the next one or want me to keep well, going here? No, keep going. And I've got – so well, let me take one here real quickly. Uh, so, Mark – the when you think about, I think anchors all walk a pretty fine line, uh, as we talked earlier, between being an opinion journalist and an anchor, because you guys have opinions, you have experiences, you're close to the action. Will news anchoring change a lot? I mean, I'm watching cable news. Um, you know, it's changed a lot. Uh, I don't think for the best, actually. Uh, what will news anchoring, uh, net, network, local news anchoring, how will it change in the future or will it change? Well, that's a good question, Bill. And, you know, uh, as, as you guys know, there's a huge difference between the cable news networks and local television news. Uh, they, they are catering to their bias, whether it's MSNBC and the fact that they slant a little bit to the left or Fox News that slants a little bit to the right. Um, our situation here is that we have advertisers on both sides of that spectrum, right? And if we show our colors in any way, monetarily, we stand to lose money. And so, and we, because we'll lose viewers who don't believe that slant. So our mantra is we have to be down the middle in everything we do. We have to tell both sides of every story. We always have to interview both sides of the aisle on any issue. And if we don't, we're really cutting off our nose, right? Be, despite our face, because um, that, because as you guys know, this community is really diverse and there's a, a deep fabric in this community that if we do go one side or the other, we're toast. So local television news, I think will always Always, at least the traditional shows, the six and 10 o'clock news, the morning show. Now, there are some other shows that you can kind of have a little fun and, you know, maybe show a little a little slant. But that's not traditional local news. And uh, that's our mantra. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's exactly right. And I think that's what we appreciate about um you know, the, the local, sh I mean, listen, KTVB is not the only one. It's the one I watch because I'm connected to many, if not most of you at KTVB. Uh, but sure. I do think mm -hmm. that, that we do have really responsible news reporting across the uh, Treasure Valley. Yeah. And, you know, Bill, what I was thinking is, as you were saying that, Mark, I was thinking that, um, the one nice thing about what you do, too, is if you present both sides and you talk about what matters to people, families, Idahoans, it usually brings people together, right? It's only when we start yeah. pandering to those bases, whether it's the right or the left, that it tears us apart. 
So in a lot of ways, I kind of see KTVB and your efforts in the community and in your efforts to report both sides of the story and, and to focus on what matters to average the average Idahoan and family. I just think you're an important, uh, you're an important uh, force to pull people back together, if that makes sense. And you look right. at what you do with your seven cares. Right. I mean, it's just it's community event after community event. It's bringing us together. So I just couldn't couldn't speak high enough about what you do to bring bring us together here. That's fantastic. I was just going to say, Tommy, along those lines, that when you were running for governor, it was it was difficult for me because uh, we're such good friends, and at the same time, you knew that I had a job to do, and I had to ask you the tough questions, and uh, I knew that those questions were not only one going to be hard hard for me to ask because they were very pointed and it, it did that campaign. I don't know if you remember this far back, but it got a little bit ugly and I, I had to, I had to kind of hold your feet to the fire. And that was, that was hard for me as a friend to, to hit you with those hard questions. But I knew that if I didn't, I would lose respect from those that watched me. If I didn't ask you about, you know, why you came at Raul that hard and, and then Raul came back at you that hard. And, and, and so that, that was hard, but again, I had to do it. And, and you knew that I did. And, and the most, and the most amazing, and the most amazing thing, Mark still asks you the hard questions on a personal basis. He's never going to let up <laughs> off of you. There's no way. He's, yeah, and you know what, Mark? I expected nothing less. That's I think it speaks a lot to your professionalism. Yeah. I mean, walking in there, I knew I knew I'd get harder questions from you than anybody else, right? Because that's what you do. So, uh, respected that uh, very much. Uh, I, I asked you a question. I did, uh, what advice would you give younger profession? professionals mark whether it whether it's in journalism or broadcasting just if you think about your career and what are the qualities you would foster in yourself if you were a young leader young professional looking to be successful in life mm. well it, it's uh, I always I always get that question and I always say the same thing and it's it's two things it's very simple and and there are two traits that both of you guys have Um the one, the first one is be curious. You have to have curiosity. And I believe that that's something you're born with. But I also believe that's something you can learn to be is curious. You have to wonder about everything that is in front of you. And then two, you have to be a good listener. And that's why I think that the great business leaders like you both are, you both ask awesome questions of those that work with you or for you. And then you listen to the answers that they give you. Nothing drives me more crazy than a young reporter who goes in the field and is interviewing Tommy Alquist, the developer, and and says, boy, this is going to be a large complex. And Tommy Alquist says, yeah, it is. But that's only the tip of this iceberg. And the reporter says, what's going to be here? And Tommy <laughs> goes, well, this complex, that's not all. Okay, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> what? You, you just missed the story. He gave you the perfect tease. You weren't listening and you weren't curious. And I always tell every young reporter, ask questions and then listen to the answer because you're going to get your next question from that answer, not the questions that you've written down in your pad. That's some good right, stuff right, right there, Bill. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, if you know, I watch it happen all the time and especially you have that young reporter out and, um, and they get into the story and they're deep and the, the weather's bad or whatever. And then you kind of go, 
okay, what happened here? Nothing. We don't know what happened. That's a good, really good point. <laughs> right. Super point. That's great. I, I do want to hit on one other thing with you, Mark. Uh, you're in Texas right now, and I know you're used to ask, asking us questions, and but you're the story for us today. And, and I want to, you know, your, your, your mom's 85, uh, mm-hmm. been in the same house for 45 years, uh, yep. big transition, and you're down as a good son, helping her pack and helping her move. Uh, that's a big transition. Uh, tell us a little bit how, about how that's been for you and your mom, and, and actually tell us a little bit about your mother and the, the relationship you have. Oh, I, she is, uh, she's. 19 and a half years older than me. So we kind of grew up together and um, I adore her and she's just the most amazing woman. We lost my dad three years ago to pancreatic cancer. And she, frankly, as any 85 year old would be, this house has gotten too big for her. And she, uh, as you guys know, in Houston, they have hurricanes and floods and Oh, snowstorms. And so it's it's time. And so we're moving her to Fort Worth in a very, very nice senior apartment. Uh, I call it a penthouse, 15th floor overlooking TCU and Colonial Country Club, not far from where my sister and brother-in-law live. And so we're moving her there. But it's it's traumatic. You live somewhere for 45 years and you get ingrained in that community, in that house, and you have to be extricated from that house. And she's got some moments of anxiety and anxiousness. But I'll tell you what, after we finished doing everything we had to do and getting rid of all of the stuff, she said, I'm ready for a new adventure. I'm ready for the next 15 years of my life. And it was kind of like a (laughs) moment. And she said, let's go. Let's go. And so, so, so we are letting go. No, that is super. Hey, uh, let's talk about sports just a little bit. Um, You know, the one thing that I, I appreciate so much is the fact that, I can feel your energy around Final Four, around Super Bowl, around World Series. And, <laughs> yeah. and you're not the sports anchor, Mark. But on the other hand, right. I can feel the energy from you. You love sports. What's your favorite sport today? You know, that's, uh, that's a tough one, Bill, because, um, you know, my Green Bay Packers are my, uh, are my team. But – uh, boy, I'll tell you, I did not enjoy covering them. Uh, there's a lot of jerks in those lo- in those professional locker rooms, and I really, really got a sour taste in my mouth for some of those guys. And and uh, I will say though, Brett Favre went, came to my going away party in Milwaukee when I left in uh, 1994, and uh, I, I stayed friends with him for a while. We've lost touch, but. Um, I would say my favorite sport uh, to cover, uh, it would have to be, and and this, I'm going to call it an event, uh, would be the Olympics. As you guys know, I've, I've been to six Olympic Games, and uh, I spent – uh, an entire month in Sydney, Australia, in Torino, Italy, in Athens, Greece, in Vancouver, in Salt Lake, in Calgary. Um, I would say it would be the Olympics and really the Winter Olympics would, would be at the top of my list because I absolutely love Olympic hockey and I love the, the downhill skiing and the slalom skiing and, um, uh, as both of you know, we've had a number of great stories here. Peekaboo Street is still a friend of mine. Of course, we lost the uh, Jared P- Speedy Peterson in 2010, uh, and he was a really good friend of mine. And then, of course, I covered Kristen Armstrong in Athens in um her first Olympic Games uh, before she won her three gold medals. And uh, 
I don't know, Tommy, if you've met Kristen, but she is a uh, she's really a, a good person, and she might be somebody you might want to look at, maybe getting on your team. But uh, yeah, I, I would say it would be the Olympics. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So to go with sports, just a second. Um, listen, we've experienced the pandemic. You guys did a great job of covering, the, the, of course, the local issues, the state issues. Uh, we still, we're going to have the pandemic with us for a while. It's not going away soon, but we can feel it getting better. I think sports played a big role when we could get, get sports to happen again, particular, particularly college sports and, um, and of course, professional sports. Tell what you can feel that from your passion for sport. Why is it so important to all of us to be engaged with sport? You know, it's a community bonding thing, right? When Boise State is playing well on the blue, all of a sudden, it's like we're all together. Hey, did you see what we did against Nevada? Did you? Oh, my gosh, that was amazing what we did last Saturday on the blue, right? So it's a it's a community bonding experience. And if we're not there in the parking lot, in the stadium, uh, uh, huddled around a television, watching our team, there's that disconnect. And I think we felt a disconnected this year as a community because of the pandemic. We're all inside. We're all burning our Yule logs and nobody's going outside. And it just it just felt like we were separated from our community. And so sports brings us together in a communal setting where there's high fives and hugs and go steel heads and here we go hawks and it just makes you feel like you're part of a big family and that's what sports does yeah good point hey, hey mark let me let me ask you a quick follow up on that i think the timing of andy avalos coming back who i think mm. have you, i know you've been around this guy there's some, yeah. there's an authenticity about Andy that Coach Avalos that yeah. is just I think is gonna is pretty cool. And then Jeremiah Dickey, I know you've probably spent some time with him since he's been here. I'm telling you, this guy's the real deal. And so, give me your thoughts on them and kind of it, it's kind of post pandemic. Everyone's kind of getting back into it. I can't imagine a better kind of formula for success going into this next year. What are your thoughts? Well, it's all about history, right? I mean, we feel connected to the past in Idaho, the past in Boise. And there are so many people that um, have been here for the last 50 years and know the history, you know, the Tom Scotts and Paul J. Schneiders of the world. When Andy showed up and he thanked Skip Hall, Dirk Cutter, Chris Peterson, Dan Hawkins, and he rattled off those names like that. You went, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this is not some guy from out of town that just showed up here and said, oh, our turf is blue. Huh? That's crazy. When did that happen? And, you know, last week at spring ball. He asked Skip Hall to come on to the blue and Coach Hall, who uh, I think Skip is in his late 70s now. He came on to the blue with his mask and Andy was introducing him to all these uh, players on the team and saying, this is the guy that got this thing started. And then the next guy and then the next guy and all these players came up to skip and shook his hand. I said, that guy understands the history of this program. And that's the basis for the next level, right? And the next level, uh, you got to have that. And so I'm just tickled that Andy's here. Love it. Love it. Well, we got to wrap this up. Hey, I want you guys to meet my mother. That would be awesome. She, she just, she just came. Uh, she just got home. There is Joanne Johnson, my mom, 
of 64 and a half years. 64 and a half years for me. <laughs> it, it, it is an absolute pleasure to meet Hello you. Hello there. I've got, one thing, I've got one thing to say to you. You have an amazing son. This guy has got a servant's heart. He's one of the most amazing people that we have in our community. He inspires all of us. And thank you very much for the way you raised him and for what he has become. You have to be terribly proud of this guy. You just love this guy to death. Tell us a little bit about Mark. He, uh, he wants to know about me. Tell, tell Tommy a little bit about me. What am I like? He's the best. Do you mean that? <laughs> he is number one. He's the first child I bore, and he's, he's number one. I, I hope my brother and sister oh, aren't watching. Great. No, they'll never hear this. <laughs> nice meeting you. Thanks for being such a friend Very to Mark. Nice meeting you. He needs another friend. Thank you. <laughs> I love this. Hey, well, Mark, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. I think we lost Bill, but uh, we can't thank you enough. Thank you for your heart, for your passion, for your love for this community, for your friendship, for your example to us. Uh, you, you're just the best, and we, we love and appreciate you, buddy. Safe travels, and tell that beautiful mother of yours hello, and we'll see you very I'll soon. I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm just tickled that uh, Bill uh, had a rare moment where he was at home and able to do this. And Tommy, I'm just tickled that you had a rare moment where you didn't have a golden shovel in your hand, uh, gr breaking ground on a another new development. <laughs> hey, we'll, 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 hey, listen, Bill, Bill, we lost him, but just tell Mark goodbye. Hey, Mark, seriously, I lost you. I didn't lose you on purpose. I didn't mean to lose you. It wasn't by design. Uh, but anyway, we lost you over in the other room. But, uh, hey, thanks. We appreciate it. Uh, I'll continue going to bed with you every night and uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon, okay? Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank, thank you uh, You a guys lot. are the best. Thanks, thanks for thanks. doing this. This was awesome. Okay, bye. Yeah, thank okay. you. So long. You've been listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast. We hope you've heard something today that will inspire you to make a difference in the world. Join us again for our next episode.